Welcome to Texas Heart Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. I'm Zvonimir Krasier. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center in Houston. The topic of today's uh, presentation is prediction and management of conduction disturbances post TAVI. I have no uh, disclosures or conflicts of interest related to this presentation. Now, there is ample evidence in the literature as far as the need for permanent pacemaker implantation rates after TAVI that they vary tremendously uh, based on the publication, but also on the design of the device. So we can see that the uh, incidence of uh, pacemaker implantation can vary uh, from Sapien 3 publications from 4% to uh, Lotus uh, publications up to 37%. In general, it has been reported uh, that permanent pacemaker need and implantation was higher in patients with a, a self-expanding valve than a balloon expandable valve. So we can see that it's relatively low in the Sapien 3 valves and it's higher in Evolute R and Lotus valve that are self-expanding valves. Now, as far as the conduction disturbances are concerned and the need for a permanent pacemaker amputation, uh, it depends on a multitude of uh, factors as far as decision is concerned to implant or not to implant a pacemaker. It depends whether uh, the patient has a more advanced uh, degree uh, conduction disturbance or relatively mild, whether it's type uh, uh, 1 or whether it's type 2 uh, AV conduction or type uh, 3 AV block. Uh, obviously, the decision varies significantly. Also, it depends on patient's uh, comorbidities uh, at baseline, and therefore patients that are critically ill with a lot of comorbid conditions uh, where uh, a complete block, heart block, either intermittent or permanent, might have a serious consequences, will it lead to earlier decision to implant a pacemaker. It also depends on the post-TAVR a pathway, particularly nowadays when uh, most of the patients are uh, on a fast track protocol with early discharge and they, the they stay in the hospital typically less than 24 hours. It also depends on socioeconomic uh, factors, uh, whether there is a cost issue or uh, whether the patient uh, has uh, anybody at home that can uh, uh, take care of him or whether the patient leaves alone in an uh, environment where there is no uh, control or uh, help in case of any emergency. And also there is an issue uh, for patients that live in the very remote areas where it's difficult to do a uh, cardiac uh, monitoring as far as, again, decision is concerned to implant a permanent pacemaker. There are uh, numerous risk factors that are uh, known as far as uh, risk of uh, permanent pacemaker implantation post-TAVR. One of the uh, most predictive, predictable one is uh, the presence of pre-existing right bundle branch block, which has been reported by several investigators to be the most uh, commonly reported risk factor for the need for permanent pacemaker implantation. But there are other electrophysiological risk factors that play a role, such as baseline atrial fibrillation, that also carries a higher need for permanent pacemaker implantation, and also presence of a conduction disturbances such as prolonged PR interval at base, baseline or prolonged QRS interval also at baseline. Calcification has been also described to be a very important predictor as far as need for a pacemaker implantation. And there are a variety of scenarios as we can see in this schematic representations we can see that significantly higher calcium volumes uh, lead to a, a higher incidence of a heart block and left bundle branch block and the need for permanent pacemaker amputation. And this is particularly true for balloon expandable or sapient three valves. On the other hand, calcium distribution pattern rather than the volume influence permanent pacemaker amputation rates 
in patients implanted with accurate neo valves. And also we know that balloon expandable valves uh, have a lower incidence of uh, permanent pacemaker mutation than self-expandable valves until uh, recent uh, experiences. Now, when we look at the clinical impact on uh, mortality and morbidity uh, after permanent pacemaker implantation, we can see that most of the investigators did not find that there are serious consequences uh, between one and five years of follow-up in those patients that receive a permanent pacemaker. There is only one study that is shown here where actually uh, this was a, an important uh, factor, but uh, this was uh, uh, done on a large volume of patients with both core valves and sapient valves, but the great majority of patients had implantation of the sapient valves. So we can see that multiple, multitude of studies have shown no significant mortality impact. However, as TAVR moves towards lower risk and younger population of patients uh, who will have their uh, devices longer, this might be an important uh, complication and might have a more serious long-term consequences. When we look at uh, permanent pacemaker implantation and incidence of left bottom branch block, uh, 30 days uh, from the uh, <clears throat> low risk trial, such as a partner three trial with, uh, with uh, Sapien uh, and also Evolute low risk uh, uh, trial uh, with uh, uh, Evolute Pro. We can see in Evolute uh, Pro, Pro uh, group that uh, there was no uh, significant difference in uh, incidence of uh, new left bundle branch block at 30 days. However, when we look at the partner three trial with the Sapien 3, we can see that there is a significant difference in incidence of left bundle branch block at 30 days, where Tiber had significantly higher incidence of a new left bundle branch block than a surgical valve repair. When we look at the 30-day new permanent pacemaker implantation rate, we can see that uh, there is a big difference between uh, Saber and Taber in the uh, Evolute group, 17.4% in the Taber group, and only 6.1% in the Saber group. When we look at the partner tree trial with Sapien, we can see that there is no significant uh, difference between Taber and Saber as far as instance of a need for permanent pacemaker implantation at 30 days. Now, another important uh, issue is uh, to look at the pacemaker dependency post-procedure at 30 days. And we can see that uh, approximately 33% of patients with a core valve prosthesis and somewhat higher number, 47% with Lotus valve, were still dependent on their new pacemaker in 30 Days, and this is according to Reprise 3 data, which tell us that a significant number of patients, or somewhere between uh, 60 or 50 percent, <coughs> do not require permanent pacemaker on a long term basis. So, an important thing is to be able to find out who or which patient will be permanently dependent on permanent pacemaker, and that at the present time is still unknown. There are other risk factors that predict uh, the incidence of a permanent pacemaker amputation, and one of them is implant depth. The deeper the implant uh, is, the closer to the conduction system, the higher the incidence of need for permanent pacemaker amputation at 30 days. Now, this is a very interesting and very, very important information. And this is uh, from uh, uh, Corval Evolute R and Evolute Pro low risk uh, patient trial, which showed a tremendous variability in permanent pacemaker implantation rates. And uh, we can see here that uh, the highest volume centers reported. Uh, 
remarkably low 1.9% permanent face pigmentation, while some of the centers reported very high rate of a need for permanent face maker, uh, close to uh, 30%. So what is the reason for this tremendous difference in the need for permanent face maker implantation? Is it a learning curve? Is it a specific technique? Is it a patient selection? That is an important question to answer. Now, uh, we know that self-expanding devices or timer devices traditionally uh, in the past carried a higher risk for permanent pacemaker implantation. There is a recent study from NYU Langona Health uh, Group that examined the use of minimizing depth according to the membranous septum length approach with Evolute R and Evolute Pro valves. And uh, they published uh, this in the American Journal of Cardiology in 2019. They called this approach uh, MIDAS approach, minimizing depth according to the membranous septum length. What they have found, as far as univariate and multivariate predictors are concerned, again, the right abundant branch block was uh, the highest uh, predictor as far as need for a pacemaker implantation. But another factor that was very important was the membranous septum length than five, less than five millimeters, particularly if it is three millimeters or less in length. And that was also a reliable predictor. Larger valves such as Evolute 34XL also had a higher incidence of a complete heart block. But another factor is implant death uh, that is more than the length of membranous symptoms is also a very reliable predictor. So in their results and their conclusion, they stated that a permanent pacemaker implantation rate reduced in their experience before using MIDAS technique from 9.7% uh, to uh, 3% with the use of new MIDAS approach. Not only that, but they also show the incidence of a new left bundle branch block decreased from 26% to 9% using MIDAS technique. So this technique is being uh, uh, embraced uh, by a lot of operators because it has been shown to be of great benefit. So how to achieve this technique, MIDAS technique? Obviously, uh, we have to know the length of the membranous septum that can be obtained uh, from the CT and uh, also uh, with the use of so-called the cusp overlap view that isolates the non-coronary cusp by overlapping the right coronary cusp and left coronary cusp. And this is generally the best achieved in RAO projection. We know that the membranous septum is the closest to the non-coronary cusp. So if we have the information on the length of the non membranous septum, then we can easily measure the distance during the valve deployment uh, looking at the non coronary cusp. So this view provides us a good anatomical reference where to deploy the valve in relationship to the non coronary cusp. Also, this view elongates the outflow tract in the long axis view and helps us in being able to see the best, uh, the true length of the membranous septum. It also removes the parallax uh, in the marker band and assists with depth visualization near the non-right commissure and the membranous septum during the deployment. But it is very important when you use those technique that you should be able to obtain high quality gainy CT with contrast. And uh, this CT has to be free of movement, artifacts, and the slice miss uh, registration. Here are the examples of deployment of uh, the self uh, expanding valve uh, with a cusp uh, overlap technique. Here we can see in this image that the cusps are still not overlapped. We can see the right coronary cusp separated, a right coronary cusp 
uh, left coronary cusp and non coronary cusp, and they are not at the same level. So, in this particular view, when we rotate the patient to a 13 degree RAO and also a little bit of collar view, we can see the non coronary cusp and overlapped left and right coronary cusp. And we can see the device is probably no more than a millimeter below uh, the non coronary cusp. And then with further deployment, slower deployment, flowering, we can see the device is stationary, it's not moving downward, and it's in very close proximity with a yellow dot that indicates the lowest part of the non coronary cusp. And finally, we can see with the valve deployment. Uh, the optimal deployment of the valve with the satisfactory results. So slow deployment starting in a supraannual level allows the valve to descend to its target position with minimal catheter manipulation. And the final result is uh, shown here, probably two millimeters below the uh, lowest part of the non coronary cusp. This technique, therefore, minimizes the risk of interaction with the conduction system. So, in summary, as far as predictors and management of conduction disturbances post tarbor are concerned, we have seen from published information that right bundle branch block at the baseline is one of the strongest risk factors and predictors for the need for pacemaker implantation post tarbor but also atrial fibrillation, prolonged uh, PR interval and prolonged QRS are also playing a significant role, as well as uh, landing zone and calcification uh, that also leads to higher incidence of permanent pacemaker implantation. New onset left bundle branch block post uh has been associated with uh, higher uh, mortality and reduced uh, left ventricular ejection fraction recovery post tavern. Permanent pacemaker amputation rates vary between institution, but also between operator, and uh, as far as publications are concerned, for all valves. However, uh, the newer information, particularly related to uh, the implant depth and the cusp overlap technique, and using MIDAS approach, and measuring the distance and from the uh, membrane septum to the non coronary cusp or the length of the membrane septum uh, can certainly help us in reducing the incidence and the need for permanent pacemaker amputation post terror. However, more research is still needed to identify patients who may not be uh, fully dependent on a permanent pacemaker after a month or a few months of follow-up. And that will certainly be an important factor to determine. Thank you very much.